Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to Lake County Schools and LCA bargaining for July 29th, 2020. It's 304. I'll share my screen just with a uh, usual framework agenda there. Um, I just wanted to story real mind, I'll just give a couple brief updates. Um, but the agenda is pretty much just, uh, I wanted to mention some of the teacher intent surveys and, and progress with that that's going on. I'm sure you'll heard plenty about that. Um, yeah, I got a few questions, but we'll get to those. Yeah, and, um, and then basically I just have um, some revisions that were made on last um, meeting. Uh, and some of that I'm still awaiting information um, for clarity, but I've added a lot um, of things that have to do with the different school settings because we had talked about that last time. Um, so I'll, I'll just start by saying teacher intent surveys were sent out um, yesterday around four o'clock and they were intentionally a bit, hang on one second. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot to do roll call. I was reminded. So really quickly, we'll do some Thank roll you, call. Gail. <laughs> All right, Chad Farnsworth, Lake County Schools. Jake Stein, Sedor, Lake County Schools. Jake Stein, Lake County Schools. Linda Shepard Miller, Lake County Schools. Julie Lou Allen, Lake County Schools. Michelle Hoppenstead, Lake County Schools. I think that's all my folks today. All right, Stuart Clapp, LCEA. Tony Beckett, LCEA. Emmy Gordon, LCEA. Charlene Campbell, LCEA. Okay. Well, okay, Kathy's not on. All right. Well, let's go ahead then. I might just can't hear. I see her, Kathy Smith's here. Okay. Um, so the, the teacher intent surveys, we sent them out. Um, they're uh, purposely a bit vague just to get some general information. Um, we know there's still a lot of questions that people need answered prior to, mm -hmm. um, you know, making a selection on some of those surveys. But what it did allow is uh, for folks who were pretty already in dead intent, um, regardless of perhaps um, of going, coming back brick and mortar to, to share that. So we, we did get some valuable data out of the gate and I expect that to expand as we provide more information. And most of their questions that I've been fielding um, coming in through email, you know, pertain to decisions that we have to arrive to agreement on with this group. So I'm hoping that we can uh, at least come to some consensus so I can answer some of those questions for folks. Uh, so I've got that, those sections laid out um, and with you guys' assistance, hopefully we can resolve some of those areas as we continue to plan. Um, you know, the, the, the press for that intent survey was born out of you know, the increased uh, enrollment and desire to shift by students and families to virtual. Because where we thought there would not be as many virtual opportunities available, um, it's gonna take uh, a, a fairly decent amount of, of shifts to virtual to support the enrollment there. And I, I think it's, you know, as we've seen this thing be unpredictable in the situation as a whole, um, I just feel like we need to, you know, keep a pretty flexible mindset on on how we're managing these situations. So, and I can tell you, out of the, it's right at um, about half of our teachers responded, and about seventy percent, um, I'm sorry, eighty percent uh, have. Um, said that their intent was to return to brick and mortar. Um, 
but once that once we answer some of those questions and we have solid data to share, I'll I'll provide you guys with with complete data. Um, so I've got um I would Stuart, I want to make sure um, you get to express anything right up front that you need to before we just jump into working on the. Okay. Yeah, you know. I've got a couple questions. Okay. Um, first off, if I recall, I heard. Emily at both the task force meeting and at a board meeting say that there would be full uh, allocations to schools. Yet yeah. I'm hearing that there are allocation cuts being made to schools. So there's no allocation cuts being made at schools. Um, the, the hope was that we could leave allocations at the schools and it, let me explain, because um, it, it takes a little explanation. You know, according to our, you know, initial uh, data that showed how many people were wanting, students were wanting to move into virtual, it looked like it would not take a tremendous amount of allocations to support the virtual, as I was mentioning earlier. That shift has has greatly grown, and um, we've got a lot of students and families we're going to need to suit. Um, Take care of in the virtual setting. Uh, so, they, you know, there's some positives and negatives to that. Uh, you know, the good thing is it'll provide some opportunities for, for perhaps some people that would like to teach in a virtual setting or are more comfortable doing so. Um, but so we're looking at these as, but it's not going to have the same impact it would have had if we could have left those at the brick and mortar schools. But the way we're approaching it is if, if someone was to move to a virtual setting for to teach for Lake Virtual, they it would be a shift um, temporarily or however long it needed to be to that setting and they would be guaranteed their position to shift back. And that's part of the details I've got in the MOU um, where I was working on that. Um, so essentially what what was ambitious um, became impossible, and that's the explanation for that. So we've had to go back and and reassess. Um, so you're correct that you did hear that in several venues, and we had to punt because even if we did not want to, uh, even if we had the ability to to continue to honor that, we wouldn't have the teachers to to supply either side of it so that's where we're at with that okay the teachers who then go to virtual virtual teachers historically have been paid on a different schematic than our brick and mortar teachers are they going to be paid the same or are they going to have to switch over to the new pay scheme that we've historically used for virtual? I like to, um, they'll be, they'll be paid at their, at their regular, um, at their regular compensation and salary, not by completion of courses. Um, let me pull up and share the MOU because there's, there's sections that might answer a lot of those questions, but do you have anything, are most of your questions related to kind of that virtual setting for no. the Lake Live? Okay, do you have some other stuff? Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me pull up my other document, which was the document I was looking for. So hang on half a second. Um, all right, the, the 10 days that was um, in the, whatever it is, the, the uh, federal mm -hmm. coronavirus, whatever. 10 days. All right. Then 101261 says that a teacher gets 10 days line of duty illness. So is that a total of 20 days that is available for a teacher? I'll have to research the statute. 1012.61. Um. Uh, uh, line of duty illness or line of duty leave uh, um, section. 
uh, sections one and two, and then the 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 section one and two says after the ten days, if the teacher needs some additional time, that the school board can authorize paying for additional time out of general funds. So I can tell you just. Um, out of the gate, this wouldn't be considered a, a line of duty illness. I think that's why you're seeing uh, the request go up for it to be, you know, you're seeing the workman's comp and things like that where requests are being made for it to be considered like that. But at this well, time, it wouldn't be considered a line of duty illness. Well, actually, 101261 talks about um, uh, injury. Um, Sickness or injury occurring under circumstances, uh, emergency sick leave. Um, uh -huh. So, illness contracted or injury occurred from the cause um, by being a school board employee. Uh, so, like, like so mentioned. you're you're so workers comp. Yeah, that's why we're making a a plea to the chief financial officer, but 101261 does not make the that distinction. I would say no, the, that this is not considered an illness in the line of duty because it's not, we can't, you, it's not gonna be determined where they contracted COVID at. They could have picked it up at Walmart and come to school. Then again, they could pick it up at school. I'm not eliminating that possibility, but uh, there's no way to determine Probability is that. they're picking it up at school. That's your probability. That's, that's. If I'm in a room with 30 kids and several of them test positive and then I test positive, I would say it's an illness in the line of duty. So how would it, would it work vice versa, where if your teacher came in asymptomatic and infected kids, should they be held liable by those parents and families because they've infected kids in the educational setting? How, how are you supposed to know who infected who? I'm just going by the state law the way it's worded. No, you're interpreting the state law. So, I mean, I can go back to, I can go back to our attorneys and get legal interpretation for you if that's what please do okay please do now that well that's that's another another question um all right um so the difference the question would be can can are the two mutually exclusive or can they be used stacked um so yes, so get your attorney to look at it. Um, and I will have our attorneys look at it as well. So uh, let's see, what else do I have? Um, okay, right up front. We have principals sending out emails during the summer where teachers are not necessarily checking their emails that are saying, I need to hear from you by today if you want PPE, face masks or shields. Well, a lot of teachers don't check their email over the summer and there's nothing that requires them to do that. So if I come back to school in August 10th, my first day back, and because I haven't responded to my principal's email over the summer, does that mean I lose and, and won't get any uh, personal protective equipment? No, I think we've clearly outlined that in our previous discussions of the MOU that we've been looking at and the safety protocols that the district will provide okay. that PPE. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that those memos are still going out. So, I mean, so that's an so FYI for you. So you don't want them to ask? No, what they can't do, I don't think, is say, if you don't give me a response by today, you're not getting any. I, if you can show me where somebody said that, I, I would love to see it, because I do okay. not think that's accurate. So send it over. I will. 
Is that what right. it said? Is that what the communication said? A principal that said, if you don't answer. tell me today, no, is that what it said? From what I've been told, yes. So you didn't read it? I have to trust the my building reps who communicated that to me. Okay, just checking. Go ahead. Just like you trust your principals that they didn't say that. Um, now, the Lake Live. Okay, we've heard that there are going to be 20, 30, 40 students in a Lake Live class. Well, if you're doing a full class period and you've got 40 students, when am I collecting papers? Am I doing all of the other things and, and following up with those students? Is that going to burn up all of my planning time? Or is there going to be additional time for me to do the additional tasks involved with teaching virtually? I think the, I think we probably, and this is just a suggestion, uh, if we're getting, if we're going to get into the weeds of of exactly how Lake Live and things are going to be conducted with Lake Virtual, that if we if we can look at some of the prep work that I did in the MOU, that would probably okay. cover some of the the broader topics, and then we okay. can dig down into specifics. Is that okay with you? All right, let's see what you got. Right. Appreciate it. So uh, this is just, um, I've, I've put this under safety protocols and there's some, a lot of the changes that I've underlined were things that we discussed last time um, and some uh, edits there. When, as soon as we get off today, I'll, I'll send that over to you and we can look at it. I don't think uh, rehashing all those issues are, are okay. a good way to deal with time. So can you guys see the teachers participating in Life Live? So basically it's, it just states that due to uh, um, people selecting that option, we'll, we'll need teachers to support that demand and that teachers participating in Lake Live program will report to a brick and mortar school to teach students remotely. So that's been a question that we've gotten frequently. Um, and these are just you know suggestions on the front end prior to us talking about it. Uh, teachers and students will follow the same schedule as those participating in full brick and mortar setting. I a lot of questions, a lot from parents that, you know, were thinking Lake Live would be like a virtual, full virtual school where it was at their own pace and that's not the case. Um, teachers will be selected by their principals to participate in their school's Lake Live classes or sections based on school needs. The criteria listed below will be used to guide selection. So I know selection was a big was a big deal as far as who could go virtual and and who could or whether it's Lake Live or virtual. Um, so looking at this, um, you know, there are certain things that I feel like have to drive it and that there's a current demand based on student enrollment that exists at the school and the teachers have expressed a preference to teach in Lake Live class or section. Uh, basically, you know, just making sure that, you know, it's not something that they don't feel like they could succeed at. And the teachers uh, appropriately certified to teach necessary class or section. And then the last criteria was principals will have final decision to assign a teacher to teach Lake Live or class section. And that's basically just if we do not have enough teachers um, that are are willing, and we still have to provide support for the number of sections or classes we need, that we will be able to appoint an appropriate person um, to do so. I I really feel like we're going to have enough people um, that are willing to to limit some of their face to face at the school and are interested in and participating in that Lake Live. So if you got some questions on Lake Live, us, we can go ahead now and 
talk about some of that. So according to this, teacher preference really doesn't have much to do with it. Because option or criterion four says it's the principal has a final decision. Well, I, I think that's in, that's how things operate currently in the school as far as if there, if someone is, you know, like at a high school, if someone is certified to teach um, in a certain area, then they're laying out the schedule and, and which class or classes they're going to be teaching. So it's not a huge shift there, but uh, I think preference does come into play in the second criteria because, I mean, that's going to be one of the initial things is you want people who are willing uh, to participate in it. So explain to me how like Lake Live is going to actually work. I think that's a, a question I've had. How, what's the nuts and bolts? How is that going to actually work? So I mean, it's going to be a little different. I think uh, it's going to look different at elementary setting and at the, the secondary settings. Um, I might want to lean on some of my principals here. Um, Dorinda, can you explain how you guys are looking at Lake Live and applying it at your school? I sure would be happy to. Um, based on just right now, um, what it will be um, is a teacher will be in a classroom setting, no students, um, and will log on at 8.30. Um, they will have their students that they have um, uh, have expressed an interest in Live Lake and we have assigned them to the teacher. Um, they will go on, they may do a a mini lesson, 15, 20 minutes, and then maybe release for some independent practice, um, and then say, okay, we're gonna come back together at this time in order to have some opportunities for them to do any assigned work. Um, so the teacher will be available during that time up until let's just say, for instance, like fourth grade, um, a reading block is 8.30 to 10. And, and so during that time, teacher would be available to do instruction. Then there's the opportunity to go to specials, say from 10 to 10.45, 10.50, which would be um, teacher could go to um, collaborative planning. So the students would be released at that time um, to um, take PE, whatever it is that um, during that break. And then right after that, there's a lunch um, 30 minutes provided. And so the teacher might say, okay, we're gonna meet back on at, let's just say, whatever time that would be. I'm not very good with the lapse times. Let's just say 11.30, um, 11.45, um, and then um, be available to do math lessons, math assignments, um, and then, you know, that would go through the day. Um, the instructional day, to my understanding, for the students would end at three o'clock, um, and, um, but the teacher would be available um, during that time to, you know, help them with any assignments. So there'll be some um, guided lessons through that time. And that's the way I'm envisioning it. Um, it's uncharted, <laughs> uncharted waters, but that's um, the Lake Live would be as if they are getting just exactly what the teacher next door may be doing in their fourth grade, very similar to the instructional focus in the blueprint um, of that standard. Um, and you know, maybe assessment for the day, whatever. That way, when there is the time that they want to maybe transition back into brick and mortar, um, they are, have followed the same instructional blueprint um, and have covered the same standards and for an easy, little, little um, easier transition um, back. So that's kind of what I'm envisioning, but uh, you know, I guess it's all up to, you know, haven't ever done that before, but that's how I'm picturing it to be at the elementary level. So how was that How was that different than what we did in April and May? At the April and May with, with the um, Odyssey Wear curriculum, um, those were um, a little bit different. So this would actually be utilizing the Google Classroom. Um, and so, um, and the teacher could actually do, model the lessons a little bit more in the assign, um, not based on the Odyssey Wear curriculum. Okay, so it would be through like Google Classroom or exactly, or a yeah, Zoom. exactly. That hence, 
hence the hence the training that you know for the teachers that have expertise in the Google Classroom and the training that we'll need to be um, getting up to speed um, during um, pre planning. So how would the student interact with the teacher? Well, just as if they would, you know, whether they're putting in a chat, whatever that might be, the teacher is available during that time, um, you know, during the lesson to ask questions or anything like that. So I think that, um, again, that is what I'm picturing because they're in a classroom by themselves, you know, so. Okay. That's elementary. Now, that's elementary. Let me it's run back just a minute. I'm sorry. Um, now we're we're doing elementary teachers have gang planning where everyone has planning at the same time. But then you mentioned the collaborative planning during the day. So we're varying the schedule how? Based based on whatever the, the time that I'm envisioning, if I have enough students, let's just say for fourth grade, I've got enough that a teacher would just have to do be be using a fourth grade curriculum during that time or whatever the schedule may be. And so while they have to have their um, PE during the day, um, and so that would be a time, whenever the time the teacher um, is set to um, do their planning, that would be the time that the student then would have their um, elective, whatever that would be, um, time. And then of course there are lunch time so that the teacher can have the lunch as well. So I don't think it's um, appropriate to even think for one second that from 8.30 to 3, a child is going to be sitting in front of a computer the whole time. I agree. I think it's be, you know what I mean? I think there's going to be brain breaks. I think there's going to be time that they're going to have to have some time, whatever the teacher has assigned for them to do and the teacher be available um, so to answer any questions and go through any um, guided instruction. Um, again, that's, I've never done this before, um, but this is how I, I'm, I'm envisioning that it would work and still be effective instruction. So I'm still trying to understand the, the planning because I thought we were varying the elementary schedule. So all teachers had planning at the beginning or at the end of the day. No, that's middle school and high school. Okay. All right. Then let's go on to middle school. Good segue. Woo! Yay. See how that works? <laughs> hey, Dorinda, you can owe me later. Okay. Well, middle school, and please understand, Mr. Clatt, we're still in the planning stages here, so we don't have a full mapped out plan. It's same thing. You know, the way I see this is really running our classrooms using Google Classroom and then using um, the platform of like Google Meets where the teacher meets with all the kids in a session and does maybe a whole group instruction and then releasing the students and kind of a gradual release model to practice those skills and strategies. And then maybe, you know, when you think even about differentiating your instruction, there are kids that will be able to move and groove and the teacher will be able to meet with other kids in small group during that time that they're in the classroom for 90 minutes. So, you know, we just need to think about how can we use Google Meets and Google Classroom to make that happen and just think about how do we use the gradual release model and think about our school. We're going to talk to teachers about our school focus with reading, writing, thinking, talking and collaboration. How do we have students during that time possibly collaborate? We want to really make it, it you know, as close to being in the classroom as possible. That's our goal. So, you know, I can share with you that our teachers here are super excited about this opportunity. I've had a lot of discussion with my teachers on our campus. Um, and, you know, I can speak for East Ridge Middle School. They're gung-ho about it. And uh, they're excited about this opportunity. And they're already hitting the plans, uh, hitting the ground, trying to think of ways that we can make this happen. I also know that during pre-plan, we are going to offer those opportunities for teachers to, um, you know, have... Uh, opportunities to learn more to use Google Classroom and uh, learn more of what this platform will look like. So, you know, from a middle school standpoint, I think we'll be good to go. It's a work in progress right now. And um, if you would ask me at this point, do I have a full mapped out plan for Lake Live? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest and transparent. No, we're, we're working through this and we're working through it together. Um, but we're going to make it happen for our kids. And, and my teachers are very excited about it. Um, so that's where we stand at, at East Ridge Middle School. And it, so just for clarification, at the middle school level, it's uh, 
that it's teachers taking sections as you guys see where it's necessary. It's not a full day. So, right. So, you know, we're trying to think class. about, yeah. And so, and that's a great question. So, you know, I had, we, I had touched a little bit about this uh, in our last meeting and, you know, it would be really hard for teachers if I gave them, uh, uh, you know, if I had created one team of uh, Lake Live and they had to teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade sections. We're trying not to do that. We don't want to do that. But again, you know, Mr. Klatt, we have to let our, you know, our data drive where we need to go with this. I am looking at the, the possibility most likely will be, and I've had conversations with teachers already, that it'll be, it'll be built into their line of instruction. So it's the possibility of first through fourth period would be traditional brick and mortar, and then fifth and sixth period would be Lake Live. Um, so, you know, those are, those are things that we're looking at right now of making this happen. I've also looked at the possibility. We need to look at the numbers. There is a possibility that we could have a Lake Live team in each grade level. Um, and I will share with you that, you know, I'm asking teachers on our campus which ones are interested in Lake Live versus traditional. You know, this is a team effort, and um, I want to hear the voices of our teachers and feel them out. And there are several teachers in our you muted, Sid. There are several teachers on our campus that have told me they're willing to step up and take the challenge and want to just do what's best for the school. Um, so I think giving them that option and throwing it out there. So I'm trying to get a good, um, you know, census on my campus and where teachers and what they want to do and where they are and how they feel about it. So I don't know if that helps, but that's where we're at on the ridge, Mr. Clack. Okay. I'd like to also add, um, Stuart, that it is going to be um, w once we get the final numbers, because it may be in that one grade level that we do have an opportunity, we have enough students that we could team a little bit more. It may be that, you know, one grade level, we don't have enough. And so I think the numbers are going to dictate as far as how this is scheduled. Um, but again, trying to get the, you know, making sure that we have the 830 to 3 and including all the um, things in the instructional framework. Um, my teachers um, have already have probably four weeks of lessons. And so I've heard from many of them that have already kind of looked at that and said, okay, how could we do this to make sure that we have the engagement and the collaboration in these lessons, but doing it virtually. So maybe adapting some of the plans. And so, um, you know, as we get more um, people that may be interested in this option, then we can kind of, and know the numbers that we're kind of dealing with, I think will be assist us in coming up with a, a, a little bit more of a, um, um, definite plan. Okay. Thank you guys. Uh, high school, is there anyone who might discuss what they're looking at? It's likely very similar to what you have heard from Sid. It is, Chad, and the thing that we've been looking at, it's going to be by sections. It is no way we can pull a full line in a high school with all the directions that kids go. And we've been asking teachers. Teachers have actually been emailing me, volunteering to teach an online course and everything. And what we're really trying to do is look at trying to keep the numbers down in Lake Live so that the teacher's not overloaded because we went to the four by four to keep the numbers low. And then if I'm going to put 40 Lake Live on them, plus they're 20 something, that would be a lot of kids for that teacher. So we're trying to keep our numbers down and spread it around. So a lot of teachers are volunteering. And because um, once we can pretty much put together some teams with a ninth grade with an algebra teacher, an ELA teacher, but once we start getting up into higher grade levels, it goes all over the place for requests and things that kids need. So it's going to be different sections that we're going to have to come up with. And I think the biggest thing for high school uh, parents is that we're telling them, yeah, you got to be online at the appointed time. If the teacher's teaching at third period, third block, and it starts at 930, your child has got to be online at that time. There will not be anything after that. And so that's been, that's been a lot of the questions I've been answering at East Ridge. Will they have, yes, they have to follow their schedule with the times for the bells. So we're not looking at recording and rebroadcasting. No, I'm not, not right now. Um, I wanted to, and I know that's something that you guys are very passionate about. What I wanted to ask is, because I'm seeing in other districts where they're doing similar formats, I've seen language that, you know, I'm very careful to use volunteer because I know that becomes voluntold. So, <laughs> but if, if at a 
if you use language like at a teacher's discretion, they could, you know, record a lesson to post on their Google Classroom. If, if it's something that makes it their life easier, I just don't want to restrict it. Or if it's something that they feel like, you know, is allowing them to, you know, creatively be able to support their students, I don't want to prevent that. So what are your thoughts around if a, if a teacher has the discretion to do that? Well, Chad, I think a lot of your AP teachers already do a lot of stuff through Google Classroom that they post and put out there. So I, I wouldn't want that to stop or hinder them from doing that because they're going to end up doing that in certain sections, certain classes. So what are your thoughts on that? I just want to ensure that that A, that doesn't come back and, and bite the teacher later on or a, and I know video editing, that a student could easily take that video and dub language in, dub things in that would be inappropriate and they would say, oh gee, isn't this funny? I would want to ensure that we're protecting our teacher and that they're not going to be subject to, to discipline or, or other issues that come out of misuse of, of that. Okay. And you guys had suggested some language um, at the bottom of our MOU last time and we haven't made it there and I'm still looking at it, but I wanted to, as I'm working on that, I, I just wanted to kind of get some, you guys, thoughts verbally on it because you put in some really good um, cautionary things related uh -huh. to, to that. And then along with Lake Live, what are we looking at number wise in a class? I mean, I could see if I'm a teacher teaching two or two classes of brick and mortar, and then I've got 40 or 50 people in a virtual class, and then I've got to deal with all of the other additional work that's on top of it being a virtual class because now I've got to contact them if they're not online. I've got to do some follow-ups, extra work outside of what I would normally have to do in a classroom. Um, are we allowing for that or are we looking at limiting numbers to prevent a lot of the extra work? Yeah, as far as, you know, our having solid numbers, at each school and on where it's going to land. Uh, the principals can probably speak more to what they're seeing school by school related to what the what they're hearing from families and parents and the work they've been doing. So guys, if you want to share what your numbers are looking like currently, but I can tell you that we haven't been able to draw a hard line on numbers. That, Chad, I know that we're meeting tomorrow and because the survey ends today and mm -hmm. we can't really do anything until we start looking at those numbers and building those schedules because, you know, and, and right now the biggest issue has been electives and, you know, there's just no way as I'm talking to the electives teachers that they can actually do a late live class virtually, you know, band, choir, drama, you know, so those are things that we have to answer and try to figure out what we can do to to satisfy or, or try to do what's in the best interest of, of, of all students. But it, it's, it's, it's a task ahead of us because we had something and you know we had to go away from that and then come back. And then now just looking at the numbers and trying to make sure that we're calling these kids because even if they take the modified, for example, we need to find out the other two classes. So there's a lot of communication and a lot of things that we have to see. And therefore, I can't say right now that I can just give one teacher all late live lessons because I don't know what we will have. You know, it's totally different from middle and high where they can team and that sort of stuff. And kids are all over the place at our high school. And I can tell you, we have put some Lake Live into classes and at first we were up to 40, but now as we move through the schedule, we're able to break it down, but we're really looking at 25, close to 30 in some of them. Until we can get more teachers and find more space, we just gotta keep working it till we whittle it down. 
And we're doing that day by day with people changing what they're doing. So it takes some time to get through it. So there's no solid number, but we are cognizant that we need to try to keep that number down because we don't want to run our teachers off either because nobody's going to volunteer okay. with 40 and then I give them 20 something in all the other classes. Why would I take your class of 40? Exactly. You know, so. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I can just say it's a little premature at this point with parents still going on. I've been on the phone probably with over 75 parents today having some conversations. And so um, it's just a little bit premature, but I'd say, um, you know, definitely always cognizant of the number of student teacher ratio um, because, um, you know, let's don't make it impossible to do, you know, something that can be done well um, and make it impossible for anyone to have to do. Um, so um, just a little premature, but I'm um, definitely trying to keep the numbers down. So I think the, the consensus there is that we don't have an, a definite number on, on classes yet, but the principals are doing what they can to keep those numbers down. And it's definitely heavily weighing on their mind and being considered. <laughs> Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. I can't get to my documents, so go ahead and, and scroll on down, Chad. Okay. Um, as we were looking at, we've talked a little bit about Lake Virtual, and I think selection is a, is a big key there. So but before I move on that section, I just want to, what I was looking, what we were looking for is a way, how do we, how do we try and create opportunities for teachers that for whatever personal reasons they choose would like to teach in, in virtual, but at the same time, not be weighing out uh, people's personal factors in lives such as illnesses and, and pre-existing conditions and age and things like that, that set us up to, for issues involving discrimination. So there was, that, that's not an easy task. So I'll just say that. So you're gonna see a lot of what I'm suggesting here is based on seniority. Um, and we'll, we'll read through it and you guys can provide some thoughts on that. Um, again, do the shift is why we have to meet the demand um, a statement there and that the instructional personnel will work remotely if they're like virtual. As, so that's a big question that always comes up. Um, and they'll be trained by just like any Lake Virtual School be trained in pre-planning and they'd be expected to follow the handbook for Lake Virtual School, um, which tells kind of the hours and what the requirements are and how they, they'll they uh, you know engage parents and things of that and students and things of that nature. Um, and then that's where I put the statement that you referenced earlier, your question, teacher shifting to Lake Virtual School will continue to be compensated at their normal full-time salary. Um, so they'll know what to expect there. Okay. So our, our selection. And then um, when they shift, but uh, then I think we talked before when they sh end up, if necessary, shifting back to their home school, it would be in possibly similar positions when without losing any status or. or a... That is correct. Um, okay. So that. Um, and we'll talk about there, I have a selection section and then I have a return section. Um, so right. with, with the selection, uh, teachers that request the shift to Lake Virtual School will be placed based upon the criteria listed uh, by the order below. The teacher has expressed um, their, their preference to teach at Lake Virtual School. The teacher is certified to fill the section or class to be taught for Lake Virtual School. And the third is a appropriately certified teachers will be selected to shift to Lake Virtual School based on district seniority in comparison to the other teachers at their school. So it, what we're going to see is we're, we're monitoring the numbers that are shifting from each school. And, and as we watch those numbers move, and again, it's just like the numbers we talked about for uh, Lake Live, they're moving constantly. So I don't have definite numbers on those yet. But based on the the number of students that a school is losing a certain number of positions would be shifted uh from from let's say from sid school to to lake virtual and he would know in his mind okay i'm not losing those allocations permanently 
we're just shifting those allocations over to Lake Virtual as we as we go through the course of the school year. And if there is a demand at the appropriate time for and students fluctuate back, then that that teacher will be guaranteed to move back into their same position at the school that they left. And that's if they leave any time during the school year or um, or at the end of the school year once we hit the finish line. So when we went to when we went to go in for uh, reappointment for the following year, they would be reappointed at their home uh, brick and mortar school. Because hopefully we'll be sitting in a we'll be sitting in a better situation and maybe we'll have found an answer to this big debacle. But so it says there, uh, teachers selected to shift to LVS will be allowed to return to the same position that they have shifted away from at their original brick and mortar school during the school year or at the end of the 2021 year. Uh, teachers will be shifted back to their brick and mortar schools during the year based on student enrollment shifts back to brick and mortar schools. Shifts of teachers and students back to brick and mortar settings will generally occur following the completion of a nine week grading period. It is understood that flexibility must exist when significant enrollment shifts occur. So we're trying not to limit, um, you know, at, we just know there's going to be circumstances where perhaps somebody jumped in right over their head and, and we don't, it's so undefined, we don't know. So we just need um, the teachers and administrators and students and families to be flexible in, in, in making those shifts, but we're aiming for those to happen at natural periods of time. Okay, because at one point it was a student had to make a commitment for the entire year. So I'm glad that there can be transitions at, at nine week grading periods. Yeah, I just don't think it's realistic. And to be honest with you, I'm and not we sure we have the authority. So, um, you know, because at the end of the day, if, if we're working in a virtual setting, man, they could be going to Alaska Virtual School probably if they wanted to. So we want to keep our families here and keep our teachers here also. Um, hey, I have friends in Alaska at the uh, teachers union, so. Uh, so the, there's some criteria here for shifting back. Um, the criteria, criteria one, students shift back to brick and mortar schools, creating a need for the teachers to be shifted back to meet the demand. And then the second is the majority of students shifting back are from that teacher's brick and mortar school. And three is appropriately certified teachers will be selected to shift back to brick and mortar based on district seniority from least to greatest. So we we'll, we'd reverse it for them to go back. And I, yeah, I think they're so backing up to to number to uh, number two that there's going to be times where just because Sid's teacher has gone to virtual school because he had. Uh, enough numbers to warrant shifting that allocation temporarily to virtual school, it might not be those numbers that get shifted back. It might be gray middle that all of a sudden says, you know what, we're sending a bunch of kids back to gray middle. So if gray middle has someone sitting in virtual, we would look at the, the, the certified people in the areas that are shifting back from gray middle because they had the majority of students going back. And based on those gray middle teachers sitting in Lake virtual, um, by reverse seniority, they would they would be given the option to shift back with the bulk of the students. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Do any of my folks have any questions? Um, and then I define seniority just because you know we don't we use a lot in the non instructional world, but it's not something we use in our contract. So seniority is for the section. For, the, for this section of the MOU is defined as current consecutive years of service in the school district, experience before any break in service to the district will not be considered. And that's just a general practice of uh, seniority. So kind of want to get your thoughts on that um, and, and see what you guys think and any questions you guys have as a whole as far as like virtual and that shift. I'd like to say that, Chad, I, I think you did a really nice job on this. Um, I think it will meet a lot of the needs of a lot of our teachers um, and can help calm them. And I absolutely loved 
the enthusiasm from all three levels of principals. Um, I hope that's true that your teachers are just as excited as you're portraying, but um, it didn't sound like a, oh my God, what are we going to do? It, it's more like, a, oh great, this is something new. We, we will do this. Um, and I-, I just, Teachers do that every school year. I know, but I, this is, this is a difficult year and yep. I think that's really awesome. I, I do have one question about what happens, um, for instance, in a school where you only have one of a teacher, such as a speech language pathologist. <laughs> um, so we're looking at, we're trying to grasp the classroom first and now we're looking at the the one-offs and coaches and different things like that because that's a lot of the ones that are sending questions towards me because you know they were there meaning you know I the goal is first of all with like a speech language you know if they can provide those services virtually and effectively do their jobs um, then I think that's definitely something we want to work with so but if okay. as far as the, if it's someone trying to go to virtual that's sitting in another position. Um, I think we, we have to look at that. It, it'll be based on certification. And if, if they have the ability to go fill those needs, where we're, we're trying to determine the best we can an equitable way to shift the, the, all, the allocations temporary to the virtual school. But there, there might be situations we get bogged down to where somebody we need is sitting at a different school and their school doesn't warrant it. So we're going to try and work through, through those situations and try to provide those opportunities where we can. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so that's, that's what we've been thinking. And I, you know, a lot of these things I'm trying to familiarize myself with Lake virtual more so I can answer some of those questions because I, I hate it. I've got, uh, uh, I'll just say an extensive list of emails with people that have questions and they've been so <laughs> kind, honestly, and, and reaching out. So I don't make, I want to make sure I get back with them within the next 24 hours, but I want to get you guys feel to, and, and kind of a green light to answer some of these questions. Cause I, I know this has been a work in progress and we're, we're trying to get to the end of this document, but it keeps evolving. And, I think we're going to see it evolve. We've reached a point where it's going to start evolving in some positive ways um, because as we're starting to get closer, at least we are starting to uncover what are some more things we can do. And we might have to revisit some health and safety things to provide some extra, uh -huh. um, some extra precautions if, if we've got some additional resources that become available. So it's almost like I feel like we've got a working document here and I haven't quite wrapped my mind around you know, how do we, how do we start moving some things forward if, if we haven't resolved all issues, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so if, if you guys, if, if I can have, if, in looking especially at these, um, at these, these two different options where people are asking questions, if you can, authorize me just to answer those questions in the way we discussed, but not answer against anything we haven't agreed on. I feel like it would probably ease a lot of people's tensions and allow them to make some decisions. Yeah. Or just see, see me on the answers and then we can go from there. Well, I, I need to think a little bit through that because I, I know not all, okay not all of those folks are you guys members so i don't know what right. that means but um, we bargain for everybody right now so uh, i know but whenever i have to respect their okay their side of the communication also i think i, I right. don't think that's a bad idea but i think i can you know discuss the topics with you because what i want to do okay what i'm hoping to do is generate uh, look look at all the questions that i've pulled in from them and a lot of them are very similar and, um, and create an FAQ, and then I can share the FAQ with you guys, and that, that'll give you the, the idea of what they're asking about and where their questions still are. Okay. I know I'm gonna get questions from like art teachers, choir, band. Yeah. And I, I, have you given any thought to how those are going to work, principals? 
Put the throw it back at you. So the in, in terms of what Mr. Clatt how which, how they're gonna do their classes. For Lake Live or at all. Yeah. So um, right now I've put it out to the teachers. I mean, again, you know, please understand that teachers are just coming back and I know you know this, they're still on summer break. So I've been meeting with teachers that they volunteer to come in and we've been collaborating and meeting one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and right now we're just trying to figure, you know, what's a good plan. And, and I want to just, you know, put it out there that it's a partnership. It's not just teachers on their own. So I've met with my band teacher already. I can tell you that we have a good, uh, plan in place for um, definitely our traditional. He's going to come back and we are actually going to collaborate and work on what are we going to do for our Lake Live because I can tell you that a lot of our parents are wanting band options and this is another you know shout out to uh -huh. our teachers. He wants to make it happen. Why does our band teacher want to make it happen? Because he wants to do what's best for our kids. The teachers really truly care about our kids That's and true. they want to make sure that you know, we're meeting their needs, whether it be here on campus or at home doing Lake Live. So, uh, you know, I have to shout out to the teachers um, and thank them for doing what they're doing. So, you know, I'll be meeting with him again next week and I'm actually scheduling time right now and teachers are volunteering and coming in and we're planning together. So, you know, that's the plan of action right now, Mr. Clatt. I don't have a full detail on how this is gonna be done, but I, you know, I can tell you this, working together with our teachers and administration, we're gonna make it happen. Okay, that, I like the commitment. I appreciate it, Sid. I would just say, um, I met with the department chair for specials today and kind of went over what we're planning on doing um, for um, our students that are traditional, this based on our numbers that are scheduled to return feel like that we can continue to offer that, um, for, offer every one of our specials that we normally have following the CDC guidelines um, when the, um, you know, face mask required if um, they're unable to do six feet apart. Um, but I think that just with our sheer numbers that we're having um, come back, that it's very, very doable and our um, teachers are committed to um, still providing all of the um, wonderful electives that we do have at the elementary school. Um, but it, you know, we're working through that process and um, again, you know, we'll continue that planning for um, next week um, and be ready to go when our students come. So uh, I just also want to add, Mr. Farnsworth, if I can, Mr. Clatt, we already have started talking about safety procedures. And if it's okay with Mr. Farnsworth, I can share some of the things that we've already brainstormed with our band and also our PE teachers with Mr. Clatt, if it's okay with Mr. Farnsworth. And I've actually just shared with the parents on Facebook Live so they can see what a day looks like to make sure our kids are safe because safety is going to be our number one priority. So we are already starting those, um, those plans are in place. So I'd be happy to share those with you if you want. Absolutely. Go ahead. Please. Okay. And I'll, that kind of leads into to kind of my next questions, um, especially middle and high school where you're doing planning first thing in the morning or at the end of the day. Are there any thoughts of having students when they report to school to go directly to their classroom, which may interfere with that teacher's planning, or at the end of the day, staying in a teacher's room until they're released for buses, which again, interferes with that teacher's planning, or breakfast in the classrooms or lunches in the classrooms? High school, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Julie, I love you. Thank you. That, not, that, that would take over too much, and so we're not planning that at all. We're planning other safety things, but not for them to direct, directly report because they have 10 minutes from the time they get there. That's just enough time for them to get there and get to their door. So, no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, middle school, it was no, no. I was on the fence of trying to think, and, and remember, I want you to think about, I'm always thinking about the safety of our staff and students. I was on the fence, and I was kind of thinking about possibly doing a grab-and-go breakfast. Um, but I am pulling back from that now and thinking of using other safety measures uh, while the students are in the cafeteria to make sure that they practice social distancing, we keep them safe. So um, it's most likely going to be no, 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 like my friend Mrs. Julie Llewellyn over there. <laughs> All right. Well, you both get gold stars then. 
I can only speak for the elementary for what I'm thinking it's going to look like. And again, it's going to depend on the sheer numbers, but the type of supervision that elementary students require in order to have a safe um, and orderly environment um, and always supervise. Um, we, are st we have not ruled out the grab and go breakfast um, and it's going to just depend on um, how, how, the, how many students are coming in at one time, if we can safely have them um, supervised in a cafeteria, that may not be possible because again, I can't then guarantee what cohort they have been around. Um, and so as um, we are working through those, we are still looking at a possibly a grab and go um, to the classroom or at least outside. Um, again, um, and I, I think that we're just still trying to work through um, some of the things because we have to provide the um, supervision a little bit more um, stringent at the elementary for, I mean, you, you have four and five year olds. And so you can understand why that may be a little bit different. Um, and safety is our number one concern. And so I have to be able to make sure that those students, I mean, some of them don't even know where to go. So um, they'll have to have escorts. And so we're still working through some of those things in complete honesty store and it, a grabbing growth that has not been rolled out. So I know part of, part of the discussion, part of the discussion on lunch, you guys were pretty adamant and we didn't get real deep into breakfast last time. And that was essentially me probably presenting more of what people were thinking on the lunch and knowing that, you know, we, we frequently discuss you guys protection of that um, duty free lunch period. You know, and then what kind of kept me up throughout the course of the weekend was, okay, well, breakfast with the elementary and the little ones. Yeah, that, it becomes difficult. So, you know, there might, cuts, but then it cuts into the teacher's plan period. But that's, the breakfast would not be there. And that's where I need some open communication about it. And and as far as their planning period is not before school for the, uh, the elementary level. No, the, okay. And Sir, you had something maybe? Sorry, clarification on the plan period. It's built in from 845 to 945. And then students would be moving to class at 945. So it's not interrupting their plan period. But we wouldn't have students going into the classroom before 945. That is correct. So if we receive students, you understand that there's that 15 minute uh, block and we do have to receive students 30 minutes before the school day starts. So we've already to put, we've put a plan in place. And if we receive our car riders, and I'm also asking parents to help us too, that our car riders, if they can wait until 945, that's wonderful. Um, but if they cannot wait, we will accommodate, but we will be using uh, our places like the gym and the cafeteria and the media center to make sure that we're keeping our children safe and their social distancing during this time for that 15 minute period. And then when 945 hits, every student on our campus will be able to move to their first period or their first block. And I think that's preferable, yes. Correct. And that is, and that is the hope. It's just, uh, it's going to depend on a couple of things at the elementary level. What time buses arrive uh, makes a big difference because sometimes buses can get there at 7:50, um, and of course that's way before teachers' contract day even starts. So uh -huh. you know, I've got to figure out, you know, how many students are going to be on that bus, and if I can safely social distance them at a location, um, you know, while they may have their breakfast. So there's. Um, Again, you know, until the numbers come in, I know exactly how many students I'm talking about because um, our normal um, flow is um, that, you know, students do not go to the classroom until 8.15. And they, at that time, they've already had, you know, their breakfast. And so um, it's just going to depend on the sheer numbers of super, having to supervise them and in what location we're able to do that and provide the social distancing possible. So were you about to say one of your team members had something? I thought um, Terry Stevens, if she's on, had hey, a Terry. question, but I guess not. I guess she's not on, but she texted me saying that that, that might cut into planning. So I asked that question. Okay. Is my mic working now? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, um, Kathy, go. Yes. Um, Terry cannot get on the audio. Okay. Um, Terry and some other schools have been having an issue with the breakfast, just as Dorinda is saying, that some of them are saying that 
you know, we'll probably have to do a grab and go and have breakfast in the classroom, which does create other issues, of course, of cleanliness and whatever. But um, we've also had at least one middle school contact some teachers and tell us that they're telling them that they're going to have to go on duty at um, 930, which of course is not what we're hearing here. So I guess my only question to any of that is, when we hear of these things, we are going to automatically, I guess, send them on to Chad. Yeah. And I'm assuming then, Chad, Mr. Farnsworth, you will then take care of some of that, is what I'm assuming. Yeah. Now, I understand that we're trying to work through some of them yet at the mm -hmm. elementary. So there still may be some possibilities of working through some of those. But my only concern with the grab and goes would be some of the other issues that it might create, like I said, the safety issues, the cleanliness, the extra mm -hmm. cleaning, the extra, mm -hmm. you know, it's like there's going to create other things Bugs. doing that. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, just, just saying, just putting it out there. Um, you're ab Kathy, you're absolutely right. I've done breakfast in the classroom. I understand. And so it's not an ideal option. And so it's definitely something we're trying to work through and come up with some other options to still, you know, make sure they're fed, make sure they're supervised and maybe, you know, not have to have that. So. Right. Gotcha. Well, and, and I realize that sometimes, for example, um, um, Chad, you were saying that it's not really the, the time before is usually more than the time after school in elementary, but the mm -hmm. time before is not really considered part of the plan time, and we understand that. But the problem is sometimes, depending on the schedule, that could be up to a half an hour. And some of the schools only have like a 40 minute plan period and they still have to take the kids and pick them up and everything so they really don't have a lot of time to have a plan period per se of a total 45 minutes so it's it's kind of it's a little bit in there a little leery there and it would help of course to not have as many students in there and to have a little bit more time in the morning to grab your mail or whatever you need also and I, I know every minute counts. Um, it, I just I just ask for to consider some flexibility. It's going to be different. It's yeah. going to be a total different year. Because <laughs> I really don't picture anybody's classroom looking like a huddle house. You know what I mean? I kind of envision that they do some grab and go. You know, I know probably worst case scenario you do, but it's you know if there is some grab and go that has to occur, especially with little ones that you know I know administration is going to work. To manage those congregations and cohorts and do the best they can to right. to at least you know not make it a huge burden on everybody to lessen the burden as much as possible. So oh, I understand. I'm I'm just envisioning yeah. some little first grader that spills their milk all over the carpet and then it <laughs> smells for how long and yeah yeah. <laughs> I'm envisioning uh -huh. it too, Kathy, um, you know, and not in a pleasant way. So trying to trying to work through all of those and you know so um wait and see kind of a thing but we're yeah. going to come up with something and it's going to be great and i think if saying we, that if we get into yeah, some situations it. that we see that it's just creating a totally unacceptable environment then yes we do we definitely need to address those and and make make adjustments so and like i said if you've got situations that you feel like are specific to schools that we need to work on yes please let me know what those are and i'll work on those and get feedback I have to say, though, in, in, even in the past, I have had numerous teachers give their kids breakfast pass, and because it's a great time for collaboration and just building relationships, I can tell you I have a ton of kids that they present a breakfast pass to me in the cafeteria that gives them a pass to go sh take their breakfast and go straight to their teacher. It's a... Um, and teachers love that time in the mornings. And so again, that's at their own discretion. And, and normally I wouldn't let them out of the cafeteria. Um, but so it, they had to have that pass, let me know that their teacher gave their permission. And, um, and that was at their own doing for whatever reason. And so um, we'll just have to work through them. Okay. okay. Um, for some reason, my mic wasn't working before. Can I just ask a question back on the um, Lake Live with the Google? I know Google Meets is a little bit um, more private, I guess you would say, the course in the Zoom okay. stuff. Um, and I'm assuming then that 
Um, there won't be any type of issues with anything to do with, I don't want to put this, um, students trying to do something different while they're watching than what they should be doing in the Google Meets? You know, I, I'll have to look at that. The, the good thing is they're going to be on our devices. So it will be Go Guardian. That kind of supervises their activity. And I know Dwayne has limits he can put on their activity while that they, I don't think they can veer from what's been authorized and released from the teacher allowing them to do. So my initial answer to that is yes, we'll have some controls on that to support teachers. And if they're doing something that's absolutely out of the box, it's gonna flag um, and they'll be detected immediately at the district level that they've ventured into waters they shouldn't be in. All right, thank you. And that, that goes back to that bottom section I'm still working on. Um, so I'll, right. I'll keep pounding on that and get that done. Okay. So any other questions on Lake Live in the virtual setting that I can either get answers for or we can approach now? Not on those right now. Okay. Obviously, if you're looking at a grab and go situation, it would need to be considering, uh, they would have to be able to have that social distance piece because they won't have masks on while eating breakfast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, I, I don't know, I'll just say this, that we're, I'm hopeful we're gonna be able to revisit some of those safety protocols again very soon. Um, uh, so, so I'll give you a heads up. We'll probably need to pull a task force meeting together early next week. Um, I haven't talked to the superintendent yet, but she, I think she had some new ideas that started to flush out today um, that I think will be appealing to everybody, but I don't know the details on those yet. So I'm hopeful, you know, some of these more difficult situations that we're working on as far as with social distancing and safety precautions will continue to gain steam in those areas. So I'll, I'll get with you ASAP okay. after talking with her. Thanks. All right, ready to move on to a new subject? Sure. All right. I mean, I like the idea that we have cohorts, that we're keeping students together, that we're doing social distancing as much as possible in the classroom. The whole idea of cohorts is to kind of, of uh, have a, a quasi-protective barrier around that group. But then, if we start introducing the learning walks and walkthroughs, where you've got people moving from classroom to classroom, you're kind of defeating that whole purpose. Um, so what kind of limitations can we put on that whole concept of learning walks, walkthroughs, going from classroom to classroom, uh, introducing new pathogens from as somebody goes from room to room, uh, which kind of defeats the purpose of having cohort groups with students. Open that up for discussion. I have, it, it has been a thought, but I have not had discussion other than I know, um, the initial, when the initial topic came up, it's kind of like, kind of, it's kind of resting right now with like the world of evaluation also to where, holy cow, we just got to get school and iron out all those details. I can tell you, it's not a priority at the moment, but it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. So what I'll do is I'd like to take you guys ideas and what you're thinking back um, to the academic side of the house and, and discuss that with them. So what I, is it? I, just, I could see um, limiting those for the first nine weeks, uh, and, and that gives a chance to see how this whole COVID thing is going to be playing out in the schools, how it's going to be affecting our classes and our staff and students. I could see a moratorium for for the first nine week period. Okay. That would be my recommendation okay. right off the bat. Uh, and I would say my initial thought is that's reasonable. 
So, uh, hey, we agree. All right. <laughs> any, any, um, any other thoughts around that or? I don't know well, if it's the same thoughts, but I know we've talked a lot and I think it was brought up last time in Barty we were talking about some of the drills and different things that's going on where people thank you, are Kathy. Out and, the, and the safety issues of those things. I don't know whether they're, I, I realize it's a state thing and they're mandatory, but could they be for say again, put off for the first nine weeks and then maybe have more of them the rest of the year or something? I don't know, could we look into some of those to see if there is something that we could do for the health and safety of everybody? I think we're gonna, right now what we're doing, we're examining, you know, right there in the safety protocols is you're gonna wear masks if you're doing any of the outdoor ones and because you know it's a little chaotic from time to time and there's a lot of pressure on teachers just to account for everybody and do everything. Uh -huh. Last thing they need is to worry about, you know, that they can set their expectations and I think that will occur and and then but if they've got the masks on then that helps. Outdoor ones aren't quite so yeah. so I mean I'm not so 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 concerned about those it's more the active shooter drills that are like inside they're supposed to be all together and they're supposed to be and it's mm -hmm. like mm. almost the opposite of what we're trying to do. Correct. Exactly yes. yeah <laughs> I think but but at oh. the same time you know I think we we still have a serious issue that the legislature is not going to probably back off those requirements and we haven't gotten word that they're backing off of them at all so i think we look at the letter of the law of it and then we see where can we be flexible within that um you know and and work from there but i will tell you it will be a consideration um on managing those student health and teacher safety will be a, a consideration um i need to you know consult with the people that manage some of that language more than I do and I don't know if you can identify a hard corner or do you actually have to pile everybody into the hard corner you know I don't so I need to look at some of the specifics and work with some of that but I'll, I'll or, definitely right or even slow walk the drill rather than doing it as a full-blown drill kind of setting the expectations and slow walking it which would then meet some of our social distancing but then meet the letter of the law by having the drill. So my answer is we will adopt those, we will adapt those where we can and still meet the requirements. So I think that's a good idea, Stuart, you know, just moving through those in a less frantic pace and methodology. Mm -hmm. um, the fear doesn't have to be real. It can just be the action. Right. Yeah. Kind of like you did fire drills at the, the first fire drill. It's kind of like, okay, you're going to go to this exit. We're going to walk here as a group, whatever, whatever. Kind of the same thing. Well, and I'll tell you, it just looks like by the enrollment numbers, we're going to be dealing with some smaller groups anyway. So it, at least as, as we transition, so I think a lot of the safety protocols are going to stay in place even when, even as enrollment grows back in brick and mortar. Um, but we'll at least we'll be able to manage and work some of those things out before you know we reach you know back to normal status because we're assuming it's all going to equalize at some point um we hope about the time we got it yeah. all figured out well exactly but see we'll be good by then we wrote the book right i mean we we designed the airplane while we were flying it last fall or last spring, so. And those were some challenging times, and that's what I go back to, is these must be some challenging times, but I've never been more impressed with the teachers that just, I mean, they made it happen. They made it happen. Family, I mean, and so, you know, these may be challenging times, but we're gonna make it happen. Mm -hmm. so, do you have some other topics you wanna move uh -huh. on to, Stuart? Nothing ever, nothing, I've got one, my only next major one should be a given. What is that? We're seeing the panic. And I know it started in Lee County where they had a waiver for one specific situation. Oh. Then we went to waivers with athletes in Volusia County. And then teachers are all 
we're not there are no waivers what, what do you mean by a waiver oh that that if you get covid you're not going to sue the school and it's your responsibility and so yeah there some of these places are trying not florida so much but there have been some attempts in especially in football and athletics to get the participants to sign waivers that if you get sick or something happens, you're not going to hold the school responsible. And I just, and up to this point, I've been telling members and teachers that waivers are going to be a hard no. Well, I can tell you from a, from a student and athletic participant viewpoint, we will likely be requiring waivers from students um, but and athletes, but there's been no discussion of requiring any instructional employees of them signing a waiver or anything like that. Um, and I think what you're likely going to see is that's one thing that's come pretty consistently out of the very discussions from the FHSAA is that they uh, there they'll be the typical waivers that they sign to participate in athletics regardless. So it'll probably become a type of standardized form like they do with the other waivers, but nothing for um, instructional or, or any employees. So okay. you were hearing that they were doing that with employees? Well, that's the rumor. Oh, okay. That was the rumor because they, they saw that Volusia County had one for athletes, uh, Lee County did have one for employees, but it was for a very specific program, time limited, uh, like a two years ago, but that got on the internet and, and teachers went nuts thinking that, that they're going to be required to sign waivers. And I checked the folks at Lee County and they said, no, that was not the case. But I just want to alleviate fears because you know how folks jump on things. Gotcha. Well, I, I, nothing for adults, but I can tell you, likely for uh, student athlete participants and maybe, but it's, that's, it's, that's not really out of the ordinary, like I said, for some typical liability issues with them. Well, yeah, they sign waivers insurance. for injuries, whatever, whatever, but. So, I mean, and essentially, if, if, if you've got instructional people acting in the capacity of coaches, you know, that way, that student signing that waiver, you know, is actually adding a layer of support for all district employees involved there. So uh, it kind of benefits all of us. Mm -hmm. And then that leads, gosh, Chad, it's like you're doing my segues for me. Um, support for teachers, for students and families who I'm not wearing a mask, it's stupid. The, the, some doctor on, on Facebook Medical Center told me masks are bad and you can't make me wear them. What kind of support and backup is gonna be for the teacher who says, you can't come into my room without a mask, you can't come into my room, or little Johnny, you are going to wear your mask when you're in my classroom. Um, is it going to be a, a code of conduct issue? Or is when the mommy calls the principal and, and complains, suddenly the teacher's being told you can't make Johnny do this? What kind of support is there going to be for teachers for enforcing those kind of rules? Because frankly, we've seen dress code as an example of, of a sometimes a futile effort. Well, uh, yeah, I think dress code issues might be hard on the eyes sometimes, but I don't think they're going to give you COVID. <laughs> so, I, but I, I, you're all, right. But in all seriousness, they, um, you know, it's it's something that's been passed as a requirement through the safety protocols and the reopening for the school, and and we do consider it a requirement. So, you know, I think the the first thing you're going to hear out of anybody's mouth is, you know, the consequence for not wearing a mask is to be offered a mask. And, and we'll offer students masks. And if students are not willing to comply with that, then it's gonna become administration's issue at the school level to work with the parents to get them in compliance. And if they're not in compliance and, those and refuse to be, then those principals 
will be working with the district level to try and get them into climate compliance and reach, you know, uh, what they need to be doing. And if they can't get to where they need to be, then we're going to work them into a situation that's more suitable to their uh, what what they're willing to do, which would not be in that classroom um, if they can't wear a mask when they're not properly socially distanced. You know, I, can I envision, you know, this, this is where I envision those worst case scenarios <laughs> in the middle of the night. Because, you know, I trust me, I've had, you know, the, you know, the, the kid who shows up in a tank top every day or whatever, whatever the circumstance was. And I, I've converted a middle school from regular clothes to uniforms. And that was fun as a dean. So I, I know how people can dig their heels in, but this is a much more serious issue that, you know, it, it, we can't jeopardize the teacher towards students. So we're going to be holding the line and supporting teachers on that. And, you know, where it might not look like uh, a consequence for, say, a behavior infraction, it, the, the consequences will be, you know, a different enrollment if they can't. Continue. That's what I was going to say. If somebody really doesn't want a mask, virtual school is your ideal solution. Um, I don't know if any principals want to weigh in on the thoughts you guys have had about how you're going to approach those kind of on the ground floor. Um, I mean, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be the guinea pig today. All right. No, I just feel like I'm going to be right in line with what Mr. Farnsworth had just said. I mean, you know, I, I met with my staff this week um, voluntarily if they wanted to uh, meet on a Zoom call and we had a staff meeting. Um, it was not mandatory, but I felt that it was best and a lot of teachers were thankful that they got um, information ahead of time so we can talk about the plans. So I just want to make sure it was not mandatory, Mr. Clack. Um, and... <laughs> Uh, we had I'm glad you're thinking that. of me. Yeah, I am always just it's, it's all love man. I love you. So, <laughs> you know, um, that was a question that came up in the meeting and I, I shared, I agree with Mr. Farnsworth, you know, it's a non negotiable at this point. And the immediate response is we're going to have to remove the student and have conversations with the parents and then talk about what next steps are. Um, my goal is to hopefully work with the parent and we our goal is to hopefully work and get the if it you know, get them to wear the mask to be back in the classroom. But, you know, unless they don't have accommodations, um, they have to wear a mask. And that's our stance. And that will be my stance here at East Ridge Middle School. Yeah, I think the main thing is just everyone being accepting. If, if, if we've got a student that has medical accommodations or things that might prevent them, we definitely don't want to exclude them from their opportunities. And, and I think, you know, we can we can work those issues out. You know, I just, I don't want to, I just don't want it to become, you know, the, those issues you see on YouTube where you got a teacher and a kid fighting over a cell phone. You know what I mean? It's like, because a kid's refusing to be compliant. This is an issue that's going to be handled very professionally. And we believe the masks contribute to a healthier environment. And we're going to support you guys on that. Appreciate it. I don't want a state legislator coming in and into my classroom. We won't mention any names. I didn't. Uh, no, nah, we're 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 going to support you guys on that. Um, and I had a fleeting, a fleeting thought. I can't remember. All right, go ahead. There was something else I was missing, but. Chad, I have a question that's kind of related to the this um, related leave section. Mm -hmm. um, I did check out the health department um, COVID guidelines that are on the the website, and it's talking about if a student once after a student has gone for three days with no fever, they are allowed to come back to school. But then it also says that family members um, of that child must quarantine for 14 days. I just, that, 
<laughs> so I we could it. conceivably having the child come back and I, I don't know it either I'm reading something incorrectly or I, that I don't understand that. I, I, you're not alone in having seen conflicting okay. information from health departments and CDCs and and how some of those are um, interpreted and just directly expressed in print. Um, so I I really need to to look at those situations because they're revising things, and I heard they're gonna, they're going to release some more this week. Um, recommendations and it, it's been really weird um, and I haven't just in all honesty and working on other related issues I haven't revisited any of the new really released information that's come out in the past few days so let me look at that and and double check if you if you're aware of where you feel like some real strong inconsistencies are if you'll email me those so to help me on my path as I'm looking at it mm -hmm. um, because it, it you're right it's <laughs> It's tough, but we have, I can tell you what, what we're doing is, you know, we've created kind of a COVID-19 communication team here at the district that is, it's going to be beyond just making sure we're communicating, you know, consistently, consistently, thoroughly and legally. We're also looking at the people along with those folks working on that and their supervisors working to, to really look at we see what the CDC is telling us to do. We see where the health department is telling us to do these things. And then you got a variety of opinions that weigh in, whether they're official or unofficial. But at the end of the day, we want to land on erring on the side of, of health and safety. So yeah, I feel like we can never, we can't really go off rails and totally do what we want to, but we do have to be backed by some type of, you know, formal organizations, recommendations. So just know we're not going to do anything outlandish that doesn't make a whole lot of sense that we'll, we'll look at those, all those different analysis on, you know, uh, the quarantines and incubation periods and the periods of um, uh, possible high possible transmission and things like that. So we're digging into it and I'll just tell you, we're going to try and do what makes the most sense. So does that mean we're going to try to develop, I'm, I'm sorry, Charlene, do you have something else? No. Are we going to look at some kind of protocol, some kind of rubric as to when to quarantine a classroom, when to quarantine a grade level, when we close a school? What are, what are we looking at some guidelines as to at what point do we need to do that? What's tough is that that, that's when you, you, you've seen it, but some of the passing of the buck and some of the, you know, mm -hmm. so we don't have the authority to do it and you're not giving the authority to do it, or you can just recommend this happens. It's like, it's like, where, where do we stop passing the buck and have documentation on, on when things occur? And I will tell you, each circumstance is going to warrant a different, is going to be guided by a different set of, characteristics and circumstances. So I know it's not easy to nail down the specific situations, but whenever I asked, whenever I initially asked early on in this for, for guiding documents like you're describing, they were not available for me. So I'm hoping that there, these things are being developed. And um, I did hear uh, in a group I communicated with from Tallahassee today that there's an effort to pull and, and get some consistency across districts of what those things look like and what we're all using as a guide. So we're gonna keep pressuring for, you know, we'll provide our feedback to those folks and hopefully, and it, and it comes from some of the, you know, definitely the credible groups up there that, you know, are wanting to get schools going in the right direction because we know it's coming soon. So more to come. I, and I would think, that a pre-K class where um, at least to start with mask wearing is going to be um, intermittent and inconsistent. If you have a student that then turns up testing positive, that 
is a much greater likelihood that that's going to affect the entire classroom and the teacher being a that's being a different situation than a fourth grade classroom that is the teacher feels they are always practicing social distancing and if they're not they have their mask on um and and it seems like they the the recommendation should be different for those circumstances i think there's going to be you know if if we call from what I've seen so far if, in the experiences I've had this summer, if we call and there's holes in our information, the health department's recommendation always errs on the side of caution and quarantining the folks that were involved. Um, whereas if where I, we provided complete information that, that shows that just because someone was in an area, they were social distance, they were wearing masks, and they were following all specific protocols, then that's yielded a little bit looser. Um, then it's more of, all right, well, who are your direct contacts that broke that six foot, 15 minute threshold? You know, they get pretty specific on the questions. And if you're vague, you're gonna have a larger group quarantine. And if you got specifics and they're able to exclude folks that were not at risk, then they're able to do that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's pretty wild. I'm telling you, every circumstance we've had has been different. It's crazy, and I don't see that ending. <laughs> yeah. Um, a couple things, if you don't mind, I'd like to touch base on a little bit of this leave section, um, just to go over some of the changes. And it's obviously it's not complete, but um, you know, last time we talked about uh, making the direct contact and having the employee relations contacts on here. So we've got those so people can reach out. Um, and I, first of all, I do want to correct last time you guys were absolutely correct that the um, quick reference chart um, had not been shared in bargaining. Um, it had been shared in the, um, in the task force and in board meetings and other places, but I, we went back and check it. it had not been shared here. So I apologize for that. Um, but Thank you. we'll have that available. And the big question was, will that be available? And yes, it will. Um, it, it was, it was a tool in development. So when we do start to move forward that people prior to just firing off questions can educate themselves a little easier. Um, in the, the paid two week, you know, I clarified the 80 hours behind the paid two week um, in reference to that EPSLA uh, act. Um, and then we talked about documentation on folks um, and adding in from a licensed healthcare professional. Um, and then when we got down to instructional personnel, this was a change I made acting as a legal guardian or residing at the same residence of someone with an at risk or severe illness from COVID-19. That or was an and when I prevent it last time. And I think uh -huh. you can imagine the, the door that opens when I change that to an or. So uh, just know that makes an impact. Um, and then underneath that, you know, we ask that we may also, the district may also request proof of cohabitation. <clears throat> um, okay. Down here, we, uh, you guys asked about, well, you know, things were looking pretty good, I think, as far as the extended leave of absence, but, and, and guaranteeing those people their position, their, their same position back when they came back. And you so, said, well, and then it was, what about the displaced staff member? Could we place them out of field? I think it's, it's too, it's not easy to make a definitive statement on that because so many situations, you know, could yield something that's not good for teacher or kid. So what I put is that, um, we'll, we'll consider whether um, someone uh, can be placed in an out of field placement. Uh, there's a lot of time based on timing where it, it, could, it could start a clock on teachers to where there's no way they could meet a very, very tall order of requirements um, and, and could put them in jeopardy for other reasons. And then, you know, there's also, you, get, you wind up with teachers teaching things they don't have any business teaching the kids and that could wouldn't be good for the kids. But I did want to put in there 
that you know it'll be something that will be considered. And when I say it's considered, the process of that usually is that the principal is asking if they can do it <laughs> uh, for the teacher and and for the kids, and then it it comes directly up to uh, the senior levels of HR, and we evaluate those situations and really dig in to credentials and and what the possibilities are. And we're we always try to get it done, but sometimes sometimes they like our answer and sometimes they don't. Um, then the other part that was totally new that I wanted to get just send, let you guys look at today was you asked about donating accrued sick leave. Right. Um, you know, currently we have policy on that and and while I went back through the statute, you know, I think they said we can have some policy on that. Um, and this, some of this is just, I want to see what you guys thought um, that they may donate and their own accrued sick leave to other employees of Lake County Schools for coverage of absences due to COVID-19 related illness. Um, employees may not solicit other employees for a contribution of sick leave. An employee must have exhausted all of their accrued leave time before receiving donated sick time from another employee and any unexpended time will be returned proportionally to the employee or employee from, which, from, from whom the donation was made. And that's kind of pulling some different, I looked up some different things where so they have, they don't, might not have a sick bank, but they allow for some donations. So this language might need to grow or shrink. I don't know. It's something that I've, I've still got to run a little through a few more ringers, but I wanted to let you guys take a look at it and get some thoughts. Yeah, and I, it, some of the language is similar to, what is it, 10, 12, 61. Mm -hmm. It's in there. Yeah. Because I was thinking I recognize some of that language. Um, and then we, we conceivably could have some ADA reasonable accommodation requests and that would be handled the way we normally handle them, I would assume. Yeah, we, any ADA request would go through the normal process of ADA. Right. Um, so that, I just want to, I haven't taken this through the, through the finance side of the house where it gets into leaves and different things um, and, and payroll and things of that nature. So I'm going to be talking with them in the coming days and, and trying to nail down okay. um, whether I'm in the right ballpark. Um, but it, it can get, it, like I mentioned last minute, it can get a little difficult to manage, but you know, I think we're in, uncharted territory so and while you're doing that again check on the the state law line of duty leave versus the federal uh covid family relief act gotcha. and can we take utilize both and i i think what you're going to see just with i think i don't think this is the only area and you guys aren't the only ones bringing that up um, I'm, I'm hearing those issues are coming up all around the state, um, just with onsets of lawsuits and different things. So I imagine there's going to be, I'll probably receive some response that'll look similar to what other districts are, are getting also, but we'll examine it. We um, didn't want you to feel left out. No, I'm not left <laughs> or out. Or special. No, <laughs> not at all. Um, like you don't have enough to do, Chad. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I, I just, it's amazing. I'll just say that. <laughs> Never experienced anything like it. Oh, one other quick question. Yes, sir. I feel like Columbo. Wait, there's one more. Um, testing, who's paying for testing if a teacher needs to be tested? Um, well, right now, testing's free, right? It's a, well, it's for a now. Headache. Yeah, but, that's one of those things that um, I want to talk to the superintendent about because I think that could be related to some of the, my additional conversations with her and maybe some uh -huh. safety protocols and things. So I, I'll tell you that's trending more towards good news than bad news. So I'll, um, that's something that we'll probably, we would see at a task force meeting if we can pull one together early next week sometime. Um, but more to come on that. Uh, 
So we're kind of, we're approaching our, our, our time here. Um, what I would like to do is I know uh, I was expecting to be able to do a little more exchange of MOU, uh, but as things continue to reveal themselves and change throughout the course of the week and just working 24 hours a day, it, it did not happen. So um, what I would like to do is just, I will, I'll send you what I've been working on um, as soon as we get off of here. Um, Perfect. Just what, what we've presented today and, and I'll, I commit, we'll, we'll keep beating up on it and exchange it more. Um, I just, with all the changing environment and things I've been assigned to, it's been very difficult. So I apologize. Um, so I'll, I'll send this to you guys um, and we'll just keep exchanging back and forth. I would like to, again, not necessarily set, I, I don't feel comfortable setting a meeting yet, um, but I do want to tell you that moving into our future life, um, executive session, August 10th, um so usually when we go to executive session that means we're discussing things you guys are interested in so i think i could, I could see uh you know following that august 10th executive session what i'm preparing is uh that that uh we're ready to start talking about some normal bargaining issues yeah i know i've already requested some information okay. uh from sherry owens as part of needing info for bargaining Okay. So kind of setting that stage. And I know we've got to report something back to the state in October. Yeah. So but we I've been that's that's my other life. Um so I've been working on that stuff also. So I'm I'm looking forward to us, you know, getting back to some normal conversations, you know. But I, I really think their desire there's a desire by the board and they've expressed, you know, it's time to sit down and discuss those issues. So August tenth. We got an executive session. Um, of course, we're going to need to wrap up these issues before then. So, but if you'll allow me to kind of convene with the superintendent and see what new ideas have been coming around and how it might impact the bargaining process, um, I would like to wait and set a date before we set one for next week. We we wait to determine when. Okay. I know Monday and Tuesday are looking crazy, um, but good crazy, progress crazy. So um, sometime, hopefully after Tuesday next week, we'll be able to get back together. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Okay. We'll see where we go. All right, guys. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up if that's all right. Um, Unless somebody's got winning lottery numbers are willing to share. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> feeling lucky. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe that just means we're due. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and I got to show you my mask that my wonderful wife bought me. What is that? A beard? It's my there beard. Yeah. Is, it, is that like your real beard in photograph? <laughs> Uh, it kind of looks like it, though, doesn't it? <laughs> That's I, I, adorable. I did notice you were sporting your FEA uh, mask yesterday. <laughs> Those are pretty cool. I like the material they were made out of. Hey, they're they're breathable. They're light. They're easy to talk in. I'll give you one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I You'll might, like it. You'll I, like it. It's it's I nice. Might get, I might get kicked out of my convention wearing that. No, but, you won't. <laughs> It'd be it'd be worth the hoot though, right? They'd, they'd be they'd yeah. think you have inside information. There you go. He's switching to the other side. Yeah, I, I, I live in the middle. So. It's happened before. All right, guys. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, it's four fifty three on seven twenty nine. LCA bargaining coming to a close. We'll see you guys later. Be safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, guys.